Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Nilo Azad from Johns Hopkins and a proud member of the ICRN. Um, and it, I'm so happy to be here uh, with everyone today in person as well. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce this next panel of speakers. I, I'm one of the members of the panel, but um, our moderator is going to be Dr. Mario Strasabusco um, from the Yale Cancer Center. Um, Dr. Strasabusco should be joining us electronically. Um, he serves, he's a professor of hepatology and serves as the clinical program um, leader of the liver cancer program at Yale, um, as well as the deputy director of the Yale Liver Center. Dr. Strasabosco, are you with us? So maybe I'll just step in um, for Dr. Josephusco since we're having some technical issues. Um, I'd also like to introduce Dr. Samaria Ilias, um, who is also from the, from the Mayo Clinic and uh, part of the Department of Gastroenterology, who's also gonna be speaking on the tumor microenvironment. Um, we also have uh, Dr. Nicholas uh, Jorkstrom, um, who's gonna be joining us as a live stream, um, speaking about insights into immunoregulation in the liver. So maybe we'll get started with my talk. Um, So today in our 15 minutes together, what I'm hoping to do is provide a little bit of broad brush strokes about what is the tumor microenvironment, especially in cholangiocarcinoma, and then really provide a clinical research perspective on how we should use emerging knowledge about the TME as we design clinical trials and look for new therapies. So I'd love to start framing this conversation um, with this really beautiful figure um, from science uh, 10 years ago that really spoke to this intimate relationship that cancer cells have with the world that they live in, uh, the direct world that they live in, which is the, the cancer tumor microenvironment. Now, we have cells that become abnormal every single day of our life, and we have many redundant mechanisms in the human body to deal with this problem. Usually, this is handled in a cellular intrinsic way, meaning that a cell that becomes abnormal will either correct that damage, DNA damage repair, for example, or it'll undergo apoptosis to get rid of itself. But we need a plan B if that doesn't happen, and the plan B is really our cellular extrinsic ways to deal with cellular abnormalities for these transformed cells, and this is really where the tumor microenvironment comes in. The goal being that cells in the tumor microenvironment are, help flag the immune system that the cell is abnormal and target that cell for elimination. That's what you see over here on the left. Now, unfortunately, what happens in cancer is that an equilibrium ends up existing between transformed and cancerous cells, where initially, in this state of equilibrium, they're dormant, they may not be growing substantially, but they're undergoing immune editing and they're learning how to evade the immune system in the tumor microenvironment. And then that's what happens over there on the right where the cells become able to escape the immune system, now they're propagating, they're growing, we're having metastasis. So the goal of immunotherapy and modulating the tumor microenvironment is to change patients' tumors that have now been able to evade the immune system and move them back over to the left to the elimination pathway so we can get rid of these cells. So what do we need to accomplish this? Um, what do we need for an anti-tumor response um, from a host? And most simplistically, we need the immune system to recognize cancer cells as abnormal and rid themselves of that. But as you can see, there are many different steps. Even this is a simplified cartoon of the steps that it takes for a cancer to be involved with the immune system for elimination. So first, a tumor cell has to flag the immune system. That's upregulation up of abnormal proteins or neoepitopes on the surface of the cell. These neoepitopes have to be recognized by antigen-presenting cells like dendritic cells. 
Those dendritic cells need to mature, move into areas like lymph nodes, and then amplify their signal by interacting with the killer immune cells, cytotoxic T cells, for example. And then all of those cells that are now activated have to traffic back to the tumor microenvironment, and they have to destroy the cancer cell. And then there's, of course, many other factors um, that are involved in helping amplify this killer signal. And so each one of these areas is an area where we could potentially target therapeutically. But what I'm hoping we'll talk about in the next few minutes is every patient likely needs a little bit of a different approach in terms of how we can activate this system. But in cholangiocarcinoma and biliary tract cancers, I actually think that we're the best prepared to deal with the heterogeneity of tumor types because we've known that BTC and cholangiocarcinoma is a heterogeneous group for decades. Initially, it used to be anatomical sub differences, right? So there was extrahepatic and intrahepatic, chylar cholangiocarcinoma. Then we started to learn more about underlying etiology. Many cholangiocarcinomas come out of the backdrop of nothing, but we also have patients that are high risk because they have PSC, they have viral hepatitis, fluke-related infections, and then in the last 10 years, I think, there's been this exciting explosion of information that's more molecular about subsets of patients. We've got subsets of patients that we can target therapeutically, like FGFR2 fusion patients that Dr. Goyle and other people's work has been able to really change the way that these patients are treated, IDH1 mutated cancers. But I think I'm most excited over the last few years about some of the more sophisticated classification schemes that are coming around that aren't looking at one particular patient factor or one particular gene, but instead are looking at the totality of changes in the DNA and the RNA expression to create subclassifications of cholangiocarcinoma. And I think these are going to likely have impact when it comes to the TME as well. So I bring to your attention a paper that many in this room are already aware of, the cancer discovery paper that was really a seminal paper in 2017, taking almost 500 patients with cholangiocarcinoma, profiling them both with DNA and RNA, and finding that cholangiocarcinoma segregated not based on anatomy, but in four distinct biological subclusters, clusters one through four here, but if you look at the descriptions of these clusters, there are absolutely hints that there may be clusters that would be more sensitive potentially to an immune approach. Cluster three, for example, had upregulation of immune circuits, upregulation of immune checkpoint inhibition, Cluster one with a slightly increased tumor mutation burden, for example. So perhaps being able to use some of these more sophisticated classification schemes could be helpful in figuring out how we can target immunotherapy drug development. Now, other groups have decided to dive even more deeply into just the TME question in terms of ways to subclassify patients. And I really like this paper from a couple of years ago in hepatology. 125, 224 patients were profiled. Again, DNA and RNA, but really looking at immune subtypes, um, immune subclasses um, in terms of cells. And really based on work that had already happened in other groups that had shown that there looked like there were some tumors that, in cholangiocarcinoma that were immune and so they were able to show four different immune TME-related subclasses um, that could really change the way we consider how we think of patients for drug development. So, so the group one, which is here, if you look at the IHC photos here on the left, um, this was the immune desert subclass where there was really a dearth of any immune cell staining, and then the opposite with the I2 group, which is the immunogenic group. And then I3, which I think is really interesting because there's an infiltration of myeloid-related um, cells, or I4, which was a more mesenchymal group with more associated uh, cancer-associated fibroblasts. And so when I think as a clinical trialist of how I might want to utilize this information, I am interested in the idea as we have new drugs beyond PD-1 that are coming into the clinic, drugs that target the myeloid cell population, for example, perhaps this is how we should be identifying patients more strategically for those given drugs. And I also think that we can look at reported clinical trials already with a different lens if we keep these kinds of subclassifications in mind. So this is the Topaz-1 study, which you just uh, heard about from Dr. Doe, so I'm not going to reiterate the, the trial design. But 
while there was this 1.3 month median overall survival benefit, what I'm really interested in, I think many of us are interested in, is the tail on this curve. So who are these patients that do well long term? Because that's what we want. We want to turn cholangiocarcinoma into a chronic illness. And so there were patients even assigned to the placebo group that formed the tail of that patient population. So there were patients that did well even without exposure to immunotherapy. Who are they? How can we identify them? Is it something that's TME related? Is it something that's microbiome related, like our talk earlier? Um, is it something that is really more molecular features or epigenetic features that identify those patients? And then, of course, in terms of our conversation now, what about that added 15% to the tail with the addition of dervalumab? We absolutely need to figure out who those folks are because we need to make sure that those people are going to get exposure to dervalumab during their care. And then the holy grail for the rest of us is the other 75% of patients and what distinguishes these patients so that we can create strategies that are likely gonna be different for different subsets of that group um, so, th so that we can turn everyone into a, hopefully part of a, a, a tail that is at 100% instead of at 25%. Now I think that there are hints of this even in the single agent data. Now, Dr. Doe talked through this a little bit, but I actually wanted to look at this from a drug development perspective. So this is a trial, uh, a, a slide that my colleague, Dr. Yarshwin, presented at AACR a couple of years ago when he was presenting one of our trials. And he was really presenting it to show that there was this nominal, maybe modest benefit from anti-PD-1 or PDL one therapy alone. But I think if you look at these data, you see that there's a wide splay of benefit. There's some studies that showed a 3% response rate and other studies that showed a 20% response rate. And if we lived in a world where every single company wasn't developing a PD-1 inhibitor, I think it's very likely that we would have walked away from PD-1 agents in cholangiocarcinoma years ago when first these studies were first being reported. And I, I think that's because we wouldn't have known which were the patients that benefited, and broadly, it didn't look like we were providing the kind of benefit that we needed. So I think it really underscores how important it is for us to design clinical trials where we are getting biospecimens to really understand the people that do well. Um, and I, I hope that we're gonna do that even when it comes to other emerging areas. For example, I'm bringing up the anti-VEGF story because these are now part of our guidelines. But anti-VEGF therapy is actually kind of a classic tumor microenvironment modulating agent. So even 20 years ago with Avastin, we thought that it was modulating the tumor microenvironment predominantly through impact on angiogenesis, but there's been emerging data that VEGF therapy can also impact the immune tumor microenvironment. That VEGF, in the presence of VEGF, you have delayed APC maturation and that you have recruitment of immunosuppressive cells to the tumor microenvironment like MDSCs and regulatory T cells. So it makes sense, it's rational for us to test anti-VEGF therapy in combination with a PD-1 agent and that's what the LEAP study did and it did it in multiple tumor cohorts this arm was our BTC cohort that had 30 patients that were enrolled. But if you look at the patients that were treated, we still see just this 10% response rate, though the 70% stable disease or disease control rate, I think was, I'm assuming was the reason um, why this regimen was added to the guidelines. This speaks to the idea of with this combination, perhaps we're moving some patients into that equilibrium category where um, their cancer lives in equilibrium with their tumor microenvironment, but it has made it to the guidelines. I think there's some controversy about that, but I do think that for patients that are treated in the community, it gives an option for an immunotherapy approach if there isn't a clinical trial they're able to easily enroll in. So in conclusion, I just wanna to speak to a couple of points. I think it's very clear that the number of patients that are gonna to respond to single agent PD-1 therapy is not high enough for us to be satisfied. That likely we're gonna need two different components at a minimum. We can use agents like immune checkpoint inhibitors and other agents to optimize T cell function, but we're also gonna need agents that are gonna reprogram the tumor microenvironment, and likely that approach is gonna to have to be different because of the heterogeneity that we see in the tumor microenvironment for different patients.
I hope that we're moving to an approach where we can personalize immunotherapy for patients based on their given particular phenotype. And there is um, impetus for this before. So in lung cancer, in melanoma, in gastric cancer, so tumor types that are a little ahead of us in terms of immunotherapy, there are presently ongoing trials where patients are having their cancers profiled. Once they're profiled in terms of the tumor microenvironment, they are getting selected for different therapies based on their particular cancer's tumor microenvironment and the upregulation and downregulation of certain pathways within their tumor biopsies. So to do that, we have to have access to good and interesting drugs. And I think the best thing to come out of Topaz is I hope a, a renewed excitement from companies that we work with um, and companies that are developing IO agents to focus on cholangiocarcinoma as an area where we can develop drugs. Because if we have access to these drugs, then I think we have the possibility to do some really interesting and novel trial designs because we're learning more and more biologically about the tumor microenvironment and cholangiocarcinoma. But but it really is time to take some of these things that are so far just knowledge and start applying them to how we treat patients and how we design clinical trials. But I do think the next few years are going to be um, really exciting for our community. So with that, um, I thank you and I will introduce or invite Dr. Rizvi to come up for her talk. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be here with you all. I would like to thank Drs. Anderson and Goyle for the invitation. Um, I want to thank the Klinger Carcinoma Foundation and Stacy for all the support throughout the years. Um, I think we've all watched with joy um, the exponential growth of the Klinger Carcinoma Foundation over the past um, decade. And, uh, um, and the foundation has touched many lives from patients to advocates, physicians, scientists, and, and young investigators. And I was one of those young investigators. Uh, in 2015, I was a recipient of the Klanger Carcinoma Fellowship Award, same year that Dr. Goyle received it. And, uh, and that award was instrumental in uh, helping establish my own independent program. And so it's extra special for me today to, to speak on a topic that's very relevant uh, to my program, a program that the, the, the CCF helped set up. So I will be discussing um, successes, failures, and future ideas for targeting the TME in CCA. So what do we know about the CCA TME? We know that these are very dense desmoplastic tumors that have an abundant tumor immune microenvironment that has a preponderance of immunosuppressive myeloid cells, such as tumor-associated macrophages or TAMs. And, and as we've heard, the response to immune checkpoint blockade monotherapy has been subpar. And so what are the unmet needs? So the crosstalk between immune and non-immune components of the CCA TME is not well defined, and neither is the correlation between the immune and genomic landscapes. And defining these will inform development of new combination therapeutic strategies. There are a number of agents, some targeting the TME, that are uh, in, uh, currently under investigation, either at the discovery phase or in human clinical trials. But to date, there's no regimen incorpor incorporating TME targeting agents that has been approved in CCA. So what are the components of the CCA TME? We have non-immune cells, um, which include comprise of cancer-associated fibroblasts or CAFs, and tumor-related endothelial, uh, vascular endothelial cells. And then there are immune cells, which can be anti-tumors, such as um, dendritic cells, which are antigen-presenting cells, or cytotoxic cells, such as natural killer cells or CD8-positive T cells. And then we have the pro-tumor immune cells, um, and this includes the immunosuppressive myeloid cells that I was referring to earlier, uh, which are the TAMs and the myeloid-derived suppressor cells, or NDSCs. And recently, there have been a number of studies that have uh, begun to shed light on the role of uh, uh, immunosuppressive myeloid cells in CCA. And so over the next few slides, I will review some of that work. 
So in my, uh, in my uh, lab, we recently showed in our published work uh, the role of myeloid cells in CCA tumor progression as well as their role within the, the uh, as well as their crosstalk within the CCA TME. And we did, conducted these studies using a syngenic mouse model of carcinoma in which mouse cancer cells are implanted directly into mouse livers. Now, these cancer cells, they have abundant expression of the immune checkpoint molecule program death ligand 1 or PDL1. But when we implanted them into mice that had genetic deletion of PDL1, there was a significant reduction in the tumor burden, which indicated to us that these, that host PDL1 positive immune cells are essential for CCA tumor progression. And so then we next sought to determine which uh, component of the PDL1 positive immune cells was the dominant one. And we profiled murine tumors as well as human resected CCA specimens and found that it's the tumor associated macrophages or the TAMs that are the predominant source of PDL1 in CCA. And so naturally, we sought to block these TAMs. Um, however, interestingly, uh, TAM blockade did not reduce tumor burden uh, in our preclinical studies, um, and, uh, and that was due to a compensatory accumulation of uh, MDSCs, and the, the subset of MDSCs that you heard about earlier, granulocytic or PMN MDSCs. which you can see in that mass cytometry um, uh, data in the middle panel. And so then we wondered, uh, we, we sought to elucidate the mechanism behind this TAM blockade associated infiltration of GMDSCs, and we profiled the tumors that had, um, uh, that, that had undergone TAM blockade and assessed the expression of various chemokines and noted a significant increase in the chemokine CXCL2 and uh, using fluorescence in situ hybridization or FISH studies, uh, we demonstrated that it was the alpha smooth muscle actin positive or um, uh, CAFs that were the predominant source of CXCL2, indicating crosstalk between MDSCs and CAFs. And so we conducted therapeutic studies using a variety of uh, uh, or several different uh, immunotherapeutic combinations that you can see um, listed to, uh, to your left. And we noted that it was dual inhibition of both GMDSCs as well as TAMs that potentiated immune checkpoint blockade. There was a significant improvement in mouse survival. And we followed these animals while they were undergoing drug treatment uh, with uh, small animal imaging using micro CTs and noted a significant reduction in the tumor burden in the mice that had uh, undergone uh, um, TAM as well as GMDSC inhibition combined with NTPD1. And so to conclude, for, for um, this study, we had demonstrated that there's a significant increase in pdl one positive TAMs in uh, uh, CCA, and uh, they uh, facilitate CCA tumor progression, um, facilitate uh, cytotoxic uh, T cell dysfunction. However, their depletion leads to a compensatory emergence of uh, GMDSCs and dual inhibition of both of these uh, po cell populations potentiated immune checkpoint blockade. Um, and so more recently, there was another study that looked at TAM blockade in, um, in CCA. And so th this work was done using a different mouse model of clangiocarcinoma, which is also a syngenaic model, it's the KPPC model, KRSP53 driven. And uh, um, they demonstrated that TAMs are the predominant immunosuppressive cell type in CCA. And tumor-derived uh, uh, granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor, or GNC GMCSF, expression is prognostic in CCA. And so accordingly, in a blockade of GNCSF restrained CCA tumor growth with a decrease in TAM abundance, as well as repolarization of immunosuppressive TAMs and MDSCs, um, so uh, augmenting the anti-tumor immune response. Um, we all saw Dr. 
Greaton's work earlier on the gut microbiome, and, and so this was a study that he showed earlier. So I won't go through all the details of it, but to summarize, this examined the interplay of the gut microbiome and MDSCs in CCA, and specifically in preclinical models of PSC and colitis. And the, the, in these models, there was acceler accelerated CCA growth. Um, and so, sorry, it's not a friendly pointer. Um, and so, and this accelerated growth was attenuated uh, either by antibiotic treatment, CXCL1 neutralization, or hepatic TLR4 knockout. And uh, this was another uh, study, as we all know, Dr. Greeton is at the forefront of the field, so this was another uh, uh, study published by his group last year, uh, looking at CD40 agonism. And uh, um, CD40 agonism resulted in an increased activation of macrophages and dendritic cells, which uh, uh, led to an increased activation of the cytotoxic uh, response and consequently augmented efficacy of NTPD1. And they also demonstrated that gemcitabine cisplatin um, enhanced the anti-tumor efficacy of anti-CD40 and anti-PD1. So what about the non-immune component? So the dominant subset there are the cancer-associated fibroblasts. So this work was published by Sylvia uh, Affo and Robert Schwabe last year, and uh, using a variety of uh, inhibition, depletion, and conditional knockout approaches, as well as single-cell RNA sequencing, they demonstrated that hepatic stellate cells are the main source of CAFs and CCA and demonstrated a, um, a clear pro-tumor role of CAFs in CCA. Um, they examined different CAF subsets uh, um, and, and identified that they had d different mechanism of actions. So for, in for instance, inflammatory CAFs promoted CCA via hepatocyte growth factor, whereas myofibroblastic CAFs had a different mode of action. So what about therapeutic targeting of CAFs? So this was work that we did several years ago uh, when I was still a fellow uh, in uh, uh, Greg Gorz's lab, and uh, we showed that PDGF primes CAFs for apoptosis in CCA, and the BH3 mimetic venetoclax induced CAF apoptosis, which reduced tumor burden in a murine model of CCA. So we've now taking a look at all the different components of the, of the um, CCA TME and, uh, and how they facilitate uh, cancer progression. So what's next? As I indicated earlier, the unmet needs are that we need to define uh, crosstalk between the, the various components of the CCA TME, as well as a correlation between the immune and genomic landscapes. And so how do you do that? And one of the approaches is bulk multiomic profiling of tumors, uh, which has the advantage of providing a broad overview of molecular and immune landscapes uh, and gives us a, a, a relatively comprehensive understanding of tumor biology. And so there are uh, um, a few studies that have employed um, um, multiomics and I'll highlight two here that were presented at ASCO last year. So one study uh, employed whole exome as well as whole transcriptome sequencing and IHC of 1,848 uh, biliary tract cancers, and they identified that PBRM1 mutations, which have a role in uh, chromatin remodeling, uh, were associated with an inflammatory subtype of cholangiocarcinoma, where there was an increase in the inflammatory or uh, anti-tumor uh, macrophages, an increase in the tumor mutational burden, and an overall more favorable survival. And a second study, uh, sorry, how do I go back now, <laughs> looked at uh, um, uh, also exam uh, conducted a multimodal profiling of VTCs and showed that FGFR2 uh, mutated tumors had an increase in TMB as well as increase in CD8 T cells, whereas uh, mutant IDH tumors had an increase in B cells and plasma cells. Uh, this was a paper published in Hepatology just last year, uh, looking at a subset of uh, resected intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas, and one of their main findings was that BAP1 loss of function mutation is associated with increased expression of the immune checkpoint B7H4. 
So uh, I highlighted a few studies that had employed bulk multiomics, uh, but there are disadvantages to this approach in that it is low resolution, and so it cannot capture cellular heterogeneity and cannot identify cellular source of signals, which is really important for elucidating crosstalk. And single cell approaches may be able to overcome that um, as, as they are, they, these approaches are high resolution and they provide unique insights into cell subpopulations, uh, but they can be time and resource intensive. So in our unpublished work, we've conducted single cell RNA sequencing of resected um, perihilar distal as well as intrahepatic glandular carcinomas, and uh, uh, we've noted that there, are, in fact, are differences in the tumor immune microenvironment across the anatomic, anatomic subsets. Uh, for instance, the perihilars tend to have a preponderance of B cells. So as I indicated, using, you know, common integrating multiomics, both, both single cell and bulk, uh, will help us define the crosstalk between the CCA um, TME components, uh, as well as correlate the immune and genomic landscapes, uh, which in turn will inform development of combination therapeutic strategies because it will give us a better idea of how the different cell populations are communicating with each other, what are the mechanisms of resistance. And so that's my last slide. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I want to acknowledge Dr. Greg Gores. Uh, I think many of you know Greg. He's done a great deal um, for cholangiocarcinoma, and he's had a big impact in, on my life as well, uh, more than most people. And so um, he has been my mentor over the past decade, and under his mentorship, I've become a better physician, better scientist, but most importantly, a better human being. One of the most valuable lessons he's taught me is that the most valuable thing in life is our connections with people. And so I have the privilege of watching him every day forge bonds with others, nurture relationships, and touch lives. And he truly is a wonderful human being who makes the world a better place. And uh, I'm very grateful that I've had um, the privilege of having him as a mentor and a fatherly figure in my life. Thank you so much. And I've now made him very uncomfortable. He does not like attention. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for your time. That's uh, you just a wonderful talk and for being on time. And I'd like to introduce uh, the next uh, uh, speaker that will be online uh, is Niklas Bjorkström from the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. And he will give us uh, some insight into the immune regulation of uh, the liver in the virtual presentation. Yeah, very good. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Mario. Uh, thanks for the invitation. My initial plan was to actually be on site, but uh, yeah, that didn't turn out to, to be true but or possible. But nevertheless, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I hope you can see my slides and that you can hear me. Um, and as Mario said, I will uh, talk about cholangiocarcinoma, carcinoma, but coming into that from a more immunological point of view, I'm a human immunologist by training, also works as a clinician. And we have a longstanding interest in understanding tissue immunology more with a focus on different types of uh, lymphocytes. Uh, and that's the direction I'll take during this 15 minutes. But first of all, I think it's the liver is quite an intriguing organ in, in, in the way that it's so tolerogenic that it can, for instance, allow hepatitis B virus to just live there for years and years without uh, not very much happening. Uh, and also from everything that it constantly gets exposed to from, from the gut with antigens after every meal that we have. And, and we have uh, a distinct set of immune cells in the liver that contributes to this tolerance. Obviously, there is a threshold that this can be overcome and we can develop immune reactions as in many chronic inflammatory liver diseases. And during those, it's then perhaps partly local cells in the liver that contribute, but we also get recruitment of, for instance, monocytes into the liver that contribute to these uh, reactions. Uh, and probably one part of the sort of tolerogenicity of this organ comes from 
the sort of unique, unique composition of immune cells that, that we have in the liver. And I think it's probably one of the organs in the body that is most highly enriched for different types of innate and innate-like immune cells. Uh, and that's, of course, the different types of uh, myeloid cells and granulocytes that we heard about in the previous uh, talk. But we also have uh, a large fraction of innate lymphocytes, uh, more classical innate lymphocytes, such as natural killer cells and ILCs, but also uh, more and more innate-like or unconventional T cells. Uh, and this family of unconventional T cells that I'll spend the rest of the talk discussing in, in the context of, of liver cancer is a sort of growing family of cells where more cell types uh, get discovered every year that appear to have specific and important functions in different types of, of diseases. And a sort of common feature of all the subtypes of, of T cells is the fact that they typically don't recognize classical MSG class 1 molecules, but rather um, MSG class 1-like molecules. So we have the uh, CD1 family of, of uh, ligands that they can recognize, HLA-E being another uh, sort of non-classical MSG class 1-like molecule, uh, as well as for uh, mate cells, um, MR1, which typically don't present peptides as we know them, but rather presents uh, riboflavin derivatives that then come from bacteria. Uh, and one example of how this field is progressing is this paper from a colleague of mine that came out uh, the other year where yet another type of unconventional T-cell was, was discovered, a DNT alpha beta T-cell that in both mice and humans then showed uh, to be quite important in crossplay with uh, neutrophils in, in, in uh, sort of dictating disease outcome in, in uh, sarcomas as well as in colorectal cancer. But uh, the type of cell that I thought I would dig a bit deeper into then is the mate cell or the mucosal associated invariant T cell. And this is actually, if you look at sheer numbers, the, the most common T cell that we have in, in the human liver, making up roughly 20% of all the T lymphocytes that are, are present in, in a healthy human liver. Uh, this cell was originally identified for its capacity to. Uh, respond against bacterial infections. More recently, we have also learned, learned that it plays an important role in responding to viral infections, uh, where it can sense and, and rapidly respond to cytokines such as IL-12 and IL-18 that are produced during viral infections. But people have also more recently started to appreciate uh, functions that these cells can exhibit during tumor development and in the tumor microenvironment. Uh, and one such example is this paper that came out uh, last year that I've been looking at hepatocellular carcinoma, taking a sort of uh, single cell multiomics approach where they in the end identify uh, a type of unconventional T cell being CD8 positive, CD161 positive, which is a very good proxy for mate cells, showing them that when you have a lot of these cells going into the tumors, that's actually associated with uh, recurrent disease and a bad outcome. Uh, another study that came out two years ago found a similar picture when it comes to uh, HCC, that we, first of all, compared to normal liver and peritumoral uh, tissue, could see a reduction of mate cells within the tumor microenvironment. The cells that made it in there uh, expressed high levels of PD-1. And in settings where you then had a, uh, a sort of high presence of mate cells within the tumor microenvironment, uh, you had a worse outcome for patients. And the exact mechanism behind this is, is not really uh, known yet, but it could, for instance, be that these cells can promote a T17-like program that might not then be beneficial in the, in the tumor microenvironment. So we have been studying these cells in the context of cholangiocarcinoma uh, with a paper that came out uh, right before Christmas, where we, similar to what's been shown in HCC, using a couple of different methods, uh, could show that mate cells are depleted from the cholangiocarcinoma microenvironment. Uh, 
you can go through intrahepatic and perihilar Lange carcinomas uh, using immunohistochemistry, using qPCR, uh, using multiplex flow cytometry, where we can see, and I think you can appreciate, uh, first of all, the enrichment of these cells in just peripheral liver tissue. So in blood, it's maybe 1% of the T cells that are mate cells. In this particular example, 20% of all our T cells are, are mate cells. But then when we uh, step by step get closer to the tumor, looking at the marginal zone or within the tumor, we can see a gradual loss of these cells. We could also deconvolute the mate cell uh, signature from uh, the number of published either bulk RNA-seq or microarray data sets, and in all of these see that we had fewer of these cells within the tumor. So what about the ones that in the end make it in there? Are they affected in any way? Um, so here's an experiment where we have been looking much more in detail on mate cells, comparing them, the ones we find in blood, with uh, mate cells in the liver at three different locations. And in this sort of uh, UMAP, uh, you can then see that blood mate cells clusters in one part of this map, whereas mate cells in the periphery and at the tumor margin seems to have a fairly similar phenotype, whereas the ones that do make it into the tumor occupy a distinct uh, niche in, in this sort of map. And then down here, you can see a number of clusters for uh, the tumor that are uh, sort of specific for mate cells. So they have a clearly distinct uh, phenotype. So does this matter then, or what does it tell us? And we knew from HCC that it was actually not beneficial for patients to get these cells into the tumor. So then, uh, when actually assessing this in, into independent cohorts, we got quite surprised to see that in Colangio it appeared to be the complete opposite picture. And both of these cohorts are then uh, patients undergoing resection surgery with intent uh, to cure, where we, uh, when looking at that uh, resected liver specimen, compare groups of patients that have a high presence of mate cells compared to those below. And we could in both of these see then that high presence was associated with a better outcome. And this was an independent prognostic factor actually for outcome doing uh, multivariate analysis and comparing it to other prognostic factors. Uh, and when trying to sort of understand what this then means and, and why this is, so one thing we saw was that mate cell presence or high mate cell presence within the tumor microenvironment was actually in general associated with a sort of favorable immune composition of that uh, tumor microenvironment in general with uh, very strong correlations with modules of, of genes uh, and transcripts that associate with other sort of positive features of a tumor microenvironment then taken from the uh, cancer immunity cycle. So what does this sort of difference in role for these cells between HCC and Colangio then stem from? So I think there can be a number of sort of underlying reasons. One is perhaps the fact that uh, the sort of underlying liver parenchyma in, 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 in patients that develop HCC tend to be more cirrhotic compared to in Colangio and mate cells are sensitive to development of liver cirrhosis. Another uh, thing might be the sort of presence of uh, uh, sort of desmoplastic stroma and so on within these tumor types that is also different. A third reason uh, that we got interested a bit in is perhaps it's so that these cells occupy distinct uh, niches within the microenvironment where it's perhaps not the picture where the bile duct and the liver parenchyma forms one unit, but that we actually have several functional microunits within the liver where the composition of the immune cells will be distinct. Um, and we had a paper last year where we sort of compared the immune composition of uh, human bile duct with human liver, not in a sort of tumor context, but more in a healthy compared to uh, patients with primary sclerosis and cholangitis context. And we could then in this see that we have distinct types of T cells that either associate with uh, parenchymal tissue in the liver, 
and other types that are more uh, associated with, with bile ducts. And, and it was quite a big difference in the sort of presence of mate cells in these two compartments. And just one example on the studies uh, uh, relates to intraepithelial lymphocytes that have been studied a lot in the gut in relation to um, inflammation in the gut as well as uh, tumor development in the gut. And these are cells that we definitely can identify in, in human liver tissue, uh, co-staining for CD69 and CD103. But if you compare their presence in liver parenchyma to what we find within bile ducts, uh, that's the place where these cells uh, really uh, reside. So to sum up, uh, there are many types of unconventional T cells in humans in general. Many of these are enriched at mucosal barrier sites, including the liver. And I think it's a sort of understudied type of, of, of cells since they are uh, present at a sort of high number. They don't have the same restrictions as with antigen specific T cells that uh, were individual clones that are specific against something very often are very, very small in numbers. Uh, it appears that depending on liver tumor type, mate cells in this case then can either be uh, beneficial or uh, detrimental for the patients. And the underlying reason for that uh, is, possi is possibly uh, several, including microanatomical location of these cells as well as underlying liver disease. So looking forward, and I think very much in line with uh, the previous speaker. Uh, I think both from doing the sort of immunology of the tumor microenvironment, as well as from the clinical side, uh, I think we need to dig deeper. Um, digging deeper involves utilizing single cell approaches, but it also involves, I think, utilizing much more advanced methods to spatially localize these cells. So there are methods where you combine single cell approaches with spatial, spatial localizations or spatial transcriptomics, for instance. There is also a very interesting technological development with uh, multiplex imaging, where you can now uh, stain for 50 or up to 100 parameters on the same tissue section. Here is some of our data on uh, cholangiocarcinoma, where we have stained with 50 plus antibodies. We can digitalize this, identify every single cell, and sort of find distinct clusters of, of immune cells and tumor cells and sort of non-immune cell stroma in, in these tumors and see which cells are actually interacting with each, with each. So with that, I'd like to end knowledge, key people here in bold in my group, Christine, Martin, and Eva that uh, have made the bulk of this work, as well as many collab collaborators locally in uh, Stockholm and others in uh, Oslo, Copenhagen, and in the US. Thank you very much. Thank you, Niklas. Thank you, Niklas. Uh, and, and thank you to all the speakers uh, also for being uh, right on time. So we have uh, some time for a few questions. Uh, and uh, I open uh, the panel to the floor. Um, while we wait for some question, I, I think that uh, this uh, presentation highlighted uh, both the importance uh, and, uh, and the challenges of uh, the tumor immune environment uh, in, uh, in CCA. Uh, it's clear that the more we study, the more complex this is. We already thought it was very complex because of the multiple cell types that we have, but every cell type has subtypes and they interact in a way that might be unpredictable. And so Nilo showed us how we need to really phenotype very well, uh, you know, our patient and trying to understand uh, uh, how they do and, and uh, correlate. Uh, uh, the, the need for biopsy is evident, it's everywhere. We have great technologies that we can address, uh, but uh, it, it's a lot of work because uh, also what, what uh, Sumera uh, has shown is that you do something, but this something uh, triggers a reaction. 
And so understanding how the microenvironment adjusts to changes coming from the outside is going to be very important. Uh, so, so the question uh, for each of you on the panel is, which is the technology you think will help us gaining more insight on this? Any of you that wishes to respond? Hi, Mario. I'll, uh, um, I'll take a crack yeah. at it. So I, I, I think that I don't know if it's going to be one technology, one approach, you know, one specimen type that will do it, right? We know this is, these are very heterogeneous uh, tumors, it, even within the subsets. Uh, and, and so I, I do think that it's going to involve uh, integrative analysis of multiple approaches, right? So not only some of the multiomics approaches that I was mentioning in terms of bulk and single cell, but um, also as, as the last speaker alluded to, it's important to know what the spatial distribution um, of these different TME components is, right? So using multiplexed uh, um, immunofluorescence uh, uh, or multiplexed IEC. HC. Um, so I think it's going to be a variety of approaches, but the bottom line is the same, that we do need to um, uh, define the different components and then f try to figure out by, via functional studies how they are interacting with each other because that will be really important, right? So it's not just what is there, it's what is it doing? Because once we understand what it's doing, then we can have a better idea of how we can target them. Right. And... Um you know, do you, do you want to comment on how we can best best uh, uh, use the material that come from the studies and how we should be trying to better correlate what we see in the... In the yeah, so uh, I think that's a, a fantastic question because there are, o over the last five years in particular, I think there have been many pockets of trials that have been done where we have biospecimens from studies, but each of these studies are 30, 40 patients. Um, and, and the challenge is that each of them are being profiled on different platforms that may not really speak to each other or may not be reproducible. Um, and so what I really think we need, and I think this is a place where um, networks like the ICRN can really be helpful, is to work towards um, standardization of platforms for different kinds of analysis. So if we're going to do uh, a DNA-based analysis and we're going to be looking at a mutational analysis, we use a single platform across these studies so that even if we have, it's a rare cancer, so even if we have pockets of 40 or 50 patients, that we're able to do some cross-trial comparison. Um, I think the other issue for, for you know, I, I was a little bit on a soapbox about the idea of, of doing profiling of patients before we select therapies for them. But the challenge there is that we need CLIA level assays to be able to assign patients to studies. And um, if we look at how long it took to even have CLIA level single point mutation based analyses, um, and that was when companies had a, an investment, an interest, a business interest in doing it. Um, I think that's why we're seeing a slew of studies over the last few years that do these beautiful subclassifications of patients, but we're not able to employ that in how we take care of patients. And I think that's really the next level that we need to get to. Um, Dr. Greeton has been standing back there at the microphone for a few moments. We don't want to make him stand any longer. Um, I actually have I two questions. Well, I have yeah. one question for Nicholas. I hope he can hear this. Um, so, so these are very nice studies about the mates, but I was wondering, do you have any evidence that the mates actually exert an anti-tumor function, or is it just that they just happen to be more or less, and that this is just a correlative? That's, that's a good question. Uh, we we spent quite some time trying to uh, see if tumor cells, so the colangiac carcinoma cells, if they could for instance, take up and present bacteria to, to mate cells so that you would have a sort of direct recognition in, in that way. And so we failed in those studies, but others have shown that cholangiocytes, for instance, uh, are capable of presenting via MR1 to mate cells. Um, also that the bile contains a lot of uh, mate cell antigens. So I think all of that is very interesting and I think there is more work to do, but uh, we don't know yet. Thank you. Can I we, have a question? We have, we have Dr. Goyle uh, at the microphone as well. Hi, I have a question from the virtual um, bank. And please, anyone who's attending virtually, feel free to send in questions. Uh, this is about COVID and cancer. 
And I think because this is an immune system related uh, session, I think this is where the question is coming from. Uh, what studies are being done in patients who have had all their COVID shots? And are they producing antibodies for COVID? And I think more broadly, I think the question is around what do we know about COVID and cancer in terms of people who have been through chemotherapy, are they able to produce an antibody response for COVID? Not sure if people have expertise on the panel to answer this, but throw it out there. I mean, I, I have read uh, probably the same papers that everyone else has read, so I, I'm not, uh, I, don't, I don't claim to have any expertise in particular about this, but um, I do think that there, has, there are data that suggest that there are subpopulations of patients that don't respond as well to um, the COVID vaccine. Actually, patients that are on chemotherapy are, have not been slated into that high-risk population. So if you look at patients that um, had access uh, in terms of having access to some of the first drugs as they came around, it was people who were solid organ transplant patients or patients that um, had undergone bone marrow transplant, but not necessarily chemotherapy patients. Now, there are ongoing data analysis that's happening where they're gathering data from cancer patients, but I haven't seen that reported specifically for cancer patients. But if anyone else here has, please do speak up because I just haven't seen it. I had one question of my own, if that's okay, if anyone else. Um, so, Nilo, yesterday during the patient session, people were saying, what if you don't have one of these mutations that predicts response to, um, you know, an FGFR inhibitor, an IDH inhibitor, et cetera? What if you have extra hepatic angiocarcinoma, or what if you have gallbladder cancer and also don't have a target? Um, or if you have one of those targets and you've had a lot of the targeted therapies and you're looking for additional therapies, what can we do next? And one of our responses yesterday was, well, a lot of the immunotherapy trials right now are not biomarker selected. And you and Mark Yershwin ran the first randomized phase three, first randomized trial of immunotherapy in the U.S. And based on correlative data from that study, you now have a second generation immunotherapy trial. And I think there are a lot of patients who are online, and I think there are a lot of oncologists who are looking for trials. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how we can learn from correlative studies on one trial to inform uh, design of a next trial, and if you could tell us a little bit about your trial. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. So um, this is a trial that was really led by Mark Yarshwin when he was a fellow, and now um, he, he's, he's a, a well-established faculty member at, at Hopkins. But Mark was um, interested and compelled by some of the data that was suggesting that MEK inhibition, um, which is a targeted agent, um, but that MEK inhibition might have immunomodulatory potential, and that had been shown um, in a few different tumor types and a few different groups in the laboratory. Um, and so we opened a clinical trial to test that hypothesis just at the same time that they were doing so in colon cancer, and, and unfortunately in colon cancer, that trial um, was, was the opposite of positive. Um, but we activated the study nonetheless, and um, our, our primary endpoint was to see if we could keep people from progressing longer if they got therapy with MEK, which was the idea that that would have an immunomodulatory effect, and there were you know, multiple mechanisms that were suggested. And we met our primary endpoint, but we, it was definitely nothing to, to write home about and, and not anything that we would want to advance into phase three studies. Um, but Mark and his lab took those specimens back into the laboratory and working with his graduate student really tried to, to figure out why it didn't work the way that we wanted to in patients. Um, and what his work, which, uh, you know, Lauren Dennison was the, the graduate student doing this, it's now been published, was that um, MEK was having a, a different effect on immune cells than it was having on the tumor itself. And so while we were getting an anti-tumor effect that was modest in the cancer cells, um, it was actually inhibiting immune cell activation. Um, and so in order to deal with that, uh, we, in the lab, they added an immune agonist, and now the clinical trial is ongoing that is now a triplet therapy randomized to the doublet um, of an immune agonist plus PDL1 plus MEK inhibitor versus just the agonist in PD1 alone. So um, the study just activated. We, I think, have enrolled our, our fourth or fifth patient uh, in the last month. Uh, it literally activated a month ago, and it's going to be open at many sites across the country. Um, and I, I hope that it's successful, of course, um, but I do think it's very illustrative, so thank you for the question about how even when trials don't give us the, the results that we want, if we really dive into why that happened, if the initial hypothesis was good, what went wrong, we can really potentially um, 
continue to advance the ball and we'll see if this trial does it. Um, and if it doesn't, then we will continue to, to work and try to find uh, the next iteration as well. And as you're saying, not all trials move forward, but I will say that I have a patient on your trial who has been on it for the last three or four years and is doing really well. So to all the patients out there that even if a trial doesn't move forward, there are often success stories on each trial of people who do very well. And Nilo, is your trial on the cholangiocarcinoma website if people want to access it or can we get it on there so if people want to hear what sites it's going to be open at, they can access that? I sure hope so and we will confirm that Excellent. later today. Thank you. Hi, Francesco Facchinetti from Gustav Roussin, Paris. Uh, it's more a uh, comment than a real question to Dr. Azad. I speak as a lung cancer clinicians, clinician, and the data that you presented on immunotherapy and TOPATS-1 trial really um, make me think about what we see in small cell lung cancer. So activity of uh, single agent PD-1, uh, PD-1 PD inhibitor, not such uh, satisfying, but then the combination of uh, with chemotherapy is, uh, is something that changes the uh, standard of care. And again, not a major impact in uh, um, median overall survival, but uh, we are really interested in what is happening in the, in the tail of the curve. So I would only would like to share that I norma normally I, I'm really cautious about analogies, but this, uh, I think that uh, the biology of the disease is quite different, but the clinical results are quite uh, similar. And also the uh, next steps that we want to, to do, at least in small cell, is to raise up uh, the the tail of uh, the tail of the core with uh, with immuno and uh, um, tr try to understand which are the patients who do uh, take advantage or do not take advantage from uh, the addition of immuno to try to envisage uh, additional combination therapy thank you Thank you very much for that comment. I think with rare tumors like ours, we really um, have to learn from other tumor types as well because uh, a lot of lessons are gonna be there so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. I have a, oh, I have a question I think for all three, of, any of the three speakers. Um, bearing in mind the plasticity and how dynamic the microenvironment is and how heterogeneous it can be, as well as how difficult and potentially risk conferring it can be to obtain serial biopsies over time, or multi-site biopsies even. I'm wondering what, um, whether any of the three of you have any thoughts on uh, radio imaging or imaging modalities to sort of take the temperature of the microenvironment over time um, to assess for shifts in you know, myeloid activation or, or um, immune suppressive elements, and if so, what would be candidates that you would think are promising for study? Um, so I was like, I, by virtue of no one else taking it, I'll, I'll say that uh, I, I think that that could be extraordinarily exciting. I'm not aware of what radio tracers would be um, would be best for different cell populations, but I think if we could get there, um, that that could really open up significant because we, we can't do serial biopsies. Sometimes we're we're hard pressed to even do two, um, and figuring out the timing of those biopsies is also a big question. Um, you know, I, I've definitely struggled on clinical trials where it's been clear later that I, I chose the wrong time point. Um, for so I think that that could be that could be a, a really wonderful addition if we get to that kind of technology. All right. Hi. Is there any other question from yes. the audience? Okay. So I don't know if you can help. I'm talking. I wanted to ask a question about the AstraZeneca trial with the Dervatinbolam. Um, some of our patients are. I'm a caretaker for my mom. Um, she's getting kind of towards the tail end of being able to use cysts in the gem cysts um, from side effects. So they've got her in to start the Dervabalam, but I'm wondering if you guys can give us any insight on how important is it to do both of those chemo agents with it, if there's any reason not to give it a shot. Um, so so I, I think that that's a little bit of an open question, but there are some things in the trial that can be reassuring to the, addition, to the idea of adding it now. 
um, the, the curves really started to separate at that six month mark. And at six months was when patients that were assigned to the Durvalumab arm were getting Durva and the placebo patients were getting placebo. Um, now, Dr. Doe mentioned when she presented at ASCO that they thought the separation of the curves was a little bit earlier, like at the four or five month mark, which might suggest that you, the combination was helpful. Um, but when you looked at the data, most patients also discontinued um, combination chemotherapy around that four or five month mark, kind of regardless because of toxicity. Yeah. So I think those data are suggestive or at least reassuring that for patients who are dealing with this today that are not, you know, have already started on therapy and you're in that period of time, that adding durvalumab as a maintenance um, might be a reasonable option. Wonderful. Thank you. Hey, I think that our time is over. And unless there is uh, no other question, I just want to thank uh, the Jocasioma uh, Foundation for organizing this very nice session. I think there's a lot to, to learn, uh, and probably the foundation can be helpful in helping us to share uh, samples, protocols, uh, trying to kind of standardize uh, at least the initial approach of the thing that we still need to learn about the microenvironment. Thank you very much and bye.